There you go. Okay, my name is Sue Quincy. I work for DEEP, Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, out of state parks. And I am stationed at the state park that is down in Derby, which is the Kellogg Estate, where you'll find the Environmental Education Center and the Osborne Homestead Museum. And part of our summer programs this, this year have included many library programs and connected with libraries as well as literacy, a wildlife webinar series, which bats at our backyard, backyard buddies is the last in series of. This is um, a, put together so that we can link topics that are featured in the summer issues of the Connecticut Wildlife Magazine. Connecticut Wildlife Magazine is written and sponsored by the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, focusing on the wildlife and issues around wildlife specific to Connecticut. And it also extends into understanding habitats as well as plants and other aspects of our natural resources. So as you're listening to our program today, we'll be having uh, time for questions at the end. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. Our chat box is gonna be monitored by Laura Rogers Castro, a wildlife biologist with the DEEP out of Sessions Woods. And our speaker tonight is Maureen Heitman, who is one of the master wildlife conservation, or no, master wildlife naturalists trained by the DEEP and also a bat rehabilitator for the state. So she is gonna be giving us the background and information that hopefully will help us understand and appreciate our bats a little more. So I'm gonna turn it right over to Maureen. Oh, hi everybody, thank you, Susan. Uh, thank you, Laura. And thank you everyone in the audience. Uh, we have uh, quite a bit of information to cover, so I'll get started. Um, I'm going to do a, an overview of bats of the world, uh, just so folks can get an idea of how vital these creatures are to every ecosystem uh, on the planet. Um, I will focus on our backyard bats. And um, so, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll get started. These are five of the uh, bats that call Connecticut, the species of bats that call Connecticut home. Uh, there are nine kinds. Uh, this is an Eastern small footed bat. In reality, the, the bat is very small and it's not pixelated. Uh, this is a uh, big brown bat, silver haired bat, little brown bat, and an Eastern red bat. Bats are among the most beneficial animals on our planet. They are key to the health of diverse ecosystems and economies worldwide, and therefore vital to human health. Many kinds of plants, including fruits and vegetables, rely on bats for pollination, insect control, and or seed dispersal. Beneficial bats. Bats pollinate fruit plants, including bananas, mangoes, peaches, dates, figs, clove, and agave. Bats help to replant rainforests by dispersing seeds. 95% of tropical forests are regenerated by bats. Organ pipe and saguaro cacti depend on bats for pollination. More than 500 species of crop plants and 530 flowers rely on bats for pollination and or pest control. Insect hunting bats rid the world of countless numbers of pests, including those that carry diseases and those that destroy crops. The worth of insectivorous bats to agriculture ranges from $22.9 billion a year to $53 billion a year, and that's in the United States alone. Pretty impressive. Bats have existed for more than 55 million years, long before the appearance of Homo sapiens, which means wise man. Bats diversified and eventually comprised one quarter of all mammal species. Wherever they lived, bats played a vital role in that, the ecology of that region. Today, there would not be the diverse ecosystems 
from rainforests to dry cactus forests, if not for bats. Yet wise man has consistently massacred these gentle beneficial creatures through fear and ignorance and disregard for the natural world. Now many kinds of bats face extinction, gone forever. But we can help bats around the world, including our backyard buddies. Okay, so this is, uh, these are fossils of the uh, uh, Pliocene uh, uh, epoch 55 million years ago, bat fossils. Uh, the skeleton hasn't changed much. Uh, and as a colleague of mine likes to say, if you're perfect, why change? There are some differences, but um, I won't really go into that right now. Okay, so why bats? I'm often asked that during my presentations, why I became interested in bats. And uh, one flew into uh, our apartment in Brooklyn, New York when I was about five years old. It was broad daylight. A uh, building was in the neighborhood was being torn down. The bats were homeless, terrified. Uh, one flew into the open window of the apartment. There was no such thing as air conditioning or we certainly didn't have it as the 1950s. And uh, the bat flew in and my mother went nuts. She slammed the window shut, afraid that more bats would come in. Uh, she was convinced the bat was there just to get tangled in her hair. She told my brothers and myself to get under the table and she acted pretty much like a hand grenade had been thrown into the apartment. And then she started to, she slapped the newspaper on her head and started to flail away at the bat. And um, the bat was doing its best to avoid my mother's attack. And it did a remarkable good, a remarkably good job of it. And I was fascinated. So to make a long story short, um, I crept out from under the uh, um, bomb shelter table, opened the window, the bat flew out, and I fell in love. And this is what people back then and a lot of people still uh, believe. These are the myths. Bats are blind. Bats get tangled in hair. All bats are vampires that suck blood. Bats are vicious and carry rabies. And these are some of the headlines of the uh, tabloid papers that I uh, saw at the, in the uh, grocery store. Well, uh, the National Inqui Enquirer and World and Weekly World News Bats invade household, mother and children go mad. Woman bitten by bat gives birth to vampire. And people actually believe this stuff. So here we have some facts. There are three species of vampire bat. Vampire bats live in Central and South America. Vampire bats don't suck blood, they lap it. Their saliva contains an anticoagulant which has been studied for use as a blood thinner for heart patients. Orphan vampire bat pups are adopted and raised by foster mothers. Vampire bats share meals with ill or injured roost mates. The uh, incision that the uh, bats make with their teeth is so sharp that the animal that they are preying on doesn't even feel it. Um, there's also an antibiotic uh, in, in the saliva which keeps the, uh, the bite from becoming infected. Oops. Bats are not blind, they see very well. A bat won't get tangled in your hair. Fewer than one half of 1% of bats contract rabies. Bats are the only mammal capable of true flight. Flying squirrels and sugar gliders don't fly, they glide. Bats are not flying mice. They belong to the order Choroptera, which means hand wing. Hand wing. Bats have the same skeletal structure that humans have and the same control over their wings that we humans have over our hands. Bats have five fingers. The thumb protrudes from the top of the wing. Bats wings are very flexible and the bat makes necessary adjustments to the wing shape during flight. The bat's wing membrane 
patagium, there are several parts of that, can curve and stretch much more than a, bat, a bird's feathered wing can. Bats have more control over wing shape and can generate greater lift for less energy. A Brazilian free-tailed bat can fly 100 miles per hour in straight flight. They are aerial acrobats. These are Choroptera suborders. Microchoroptera are the smaller bats, including insectivorous and nectivorous bats. These bats use echolocation to find food and avoid obstacles. Megachoroptera, old world bats, are the large fruit bats, such as Australia's flying fox. These bats don't use echolocation. They rely on eyesight and their sense of smell to find food. Um, after all, it's not a moving target. Uh, it's a very bright colored aromatic uh, fruit um, that the bats are looking for. So um, eyesight and smell uh, are needed to find the food are used. This is a brown bat. Oh, that didn't happen in my facility. Mmm, mealworms. That bat came in, just needed to be overwintered. Oh, uh, it's perfectly fine and released uh, the following spring. And here is um, footage of a bat that I raised from a pup. Uh, this is his first flight, his maiden flight uh, in a flight cage. And you can see that he will actually take off from the ground. Uh, it is a misconception that bats cannot take off from the ground. Some kinds find it a much, much harder than others, um, but some actually uh, always uh, land on the ground, such as pallid bats, uh, to, to get their food. But anyway, here goes. Now, pallid bats eat scorpions and um, grasshoppers and all kinds of animals that, uh, that are ground dwelling. Okay. There are 1400 kinds of bats worldwide ranging in size from bumblebee to eagle. And this is the kitty's hog nosed bat. Uh, it weighs two grams as an adult and it's about two inches long. As opposed to the golden uh, crowned flying fox, which has a five foot six inch wingspan and weighs 2.6 pounds. And here is one uh, being carried by a uh, rehabber. The bat is okay. There are 48 species of bats in North America. Our local bats, there are nine kinds, are insectivores and range in size from a nine inch to a 16 inch wingspan. The tricolored bat has a nine inch wingspan. Little brown bat, 10 inches. Big brown bat, 13 inches. And a hoary bat, 16 inches. Gorgeous animals. And these are Connecticut's buddies from left to right. A little brown bat specializes in mosquitoes, beetles, flies, and midges. Big brown bat, moths, beetles, roaches, and crop pests. Hoary bat, grasshoppers, termites, beetles, moths. Silver haired bat, flies, mosquitoes, moths, beetles. Tricolor bat, mostly mosquitoes and other small insects. Eastern red bat, moths and beetles. Indiana bat, mosquitoes, beetles, flies, midges. Eastern small-footed bat, beetles, moths, flies, mosquitoes. And Northern myotis, beetles, moths, flies, mosquitoes. And bats can consume their body weight in insects every night. It's estimated that a little brown bat can consume uh, 4,000 mosquitoes in a single night. That's a lot of bugs, my friends. 
And of those bats, there are two other categories. These are tree bats and they are migratory or they can be. And these are crevice bats. This is a hoary bat, eastern red bat, silver haired bat. Crevice bats congregate in groups. Females form maternity colonies in summer. Crevice bats cluster together during hibernation in caves, mines, and rocky outcrops. Sometimes crevice bats overwinter in attics or basins. And of the crevice bats, we have the little brown, big brown, tricolor, Indiana, small footed, and northern myotis. Migratory or tree bats are the hoary bat, silver hair, eastern red bat. Tree bats prefer to roost by themselves in tree hollows and on branches. Tree bats may migrate, sometimes great distances, but they don't travel overseas. Silver haired bats may form small colonies in crevices and tree hollows. They also sometimes use caves and man made structures as hibernation sites. This seems to be happening more often than in the past. Uh, no one knows why yet, uh, as far as the silver hairs. And that is an Eastern red bat, hoary bat, silver haired bat. And that's a drawing I did of a hoary bat to show how it actually blends in with its background. Um, they're so good at camouflage uh, that if this one, if its wings were folded and it was just hanging by the bark um, and you were standing right next to it, you wouldn't know it was there and it wouldn't let you know. They don't want to be detected. So a long winter's nap, hibernation. Hibernation allows bats to survive cold weather. As winter approaches, many kinds of bats seek sites such as caves and mines that maintain a steady cool to cold temperature. The bats go into a form of suspended animation and live off stored fat reserves. The, BP, uh, the uh, heartbeat of a bat's, uh, a, a bat's heartbeat can go down to 20 from 700 beats per minute and it can stop breathing for 48 minutes. Oh bats will come out of hibernation when disturbed, which burns stored energy. On chilly or rainy days, bats enter a semi-hibernation called torpor. Bats have evolved another simple way to conserve energy. They hang upside down. When they need to fly, they just drop down and fly out. Bats' hearts and blood vessels are modified for their upside down orientation to avoid blood rushing to the brain. These are remarkably um, naturally engineered creatures. It's incredible. Echolocation. Here we have a spotted bat that doesn't live around here. That's a Western long-eared bat. And here's a pallid bat that I was talking about. Echolocation is the way bats see with their ears. High frequency sound waves bounce off target objects and back to the bat's highly specialized ears. A bat can detect an object as tiny as a mosquito while simultaneously avoiding colliding with obstacles, including your head. The bat has a unique muscle in its ear, the stapedius, which closes when the bat emits the signal and opens to receive it. This takes place in split second timing. After the target is identified as food, the high frequency calls increase in timing until they become what is known as a feeding buzz. Whispering bats, such as the pallid bat, use low frequency echolocation and their large ears to listen to the sounds of ground dwelling insects. Yes, and uh, as they are hunting and avoiding obstacles, they are scanning for prey, they are keeping in contact with other bats around them. And all of this is happening just through uh, the beams that they send out. Of course, they can still see, but they're re relying on um, uh, echolocation at night. Bat talk. There's a little brown bat. Young bats learn to fine tune their echolocation by listening 
to the calls of their more experienced hunting companions. That's a Mexican free-tailed bat. Bats have distinct and complex calls. Some are composed of specific phrases, stunningly close to what we call language. Bats in Australia have different regional dialects. Researchers use a custom-made software program to identify 4,000 distinctive bat calls in New South Wales. Batty, uh, batty baby babble. Through sound recordings of their vocal interactions, researchers found that mother bats interact with pups as they babble, which could be interpreted as positive feedback to pups during vocal practice, just like human moms do with their infants. Much like human baby talk, the pup-directed vocalizations of adult females presented a different color and pitch than the calls directed toward adult bats. Courtship and reproduction. As cold weather approaches, it is mating time for many North American bats, including those in Connecticut. The females are inseminated before going into hibernation. Gestation takes place the following spring. It's called de delayed implantation. In Connecticut, pups are born mid-June to early mid-July. Most bats give birth pup to a single pup per year. Uh, most bats give birth to a single pup per year. There are some exceptions. Big browns sometimes have twins. Hoary bats usually have twins. And red bats might have twins, triplets, or even quadruplets. And there's a red bat with twins, red bat with a single pup, a big brown bat with a uh, half-grown pup in the ju almost juvenile stage, and there's a hoary bat with two well-grown pups. Here's a juvenile big brown bat uh, waiting to be released from the flight cage. Notice the ID tag. Uh, that's for uh, tracking the bat uh, after it's released, seeing uh, to help uh, uh, to see where, uh, where it ends up. Um, it's, uh, it's important information. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't be too uh, delighted with putting a tag on a, a wild animal, uh, but it's, it's necessary data. House guests. Some kinds of bats establish maternity roosts in man-made structures, including attics and barns. Bats do not chew woodwork or wiring. Bat guano, feces, is not toxic. If exclusion is necessary, certain guidelines and precautions must be followed. Never exclude bats with flightless young. Make sure all bats are out of the building before sealing entrance and exit areas. Contact DEEP for a list of professional nuisance wildlife control officers trained to safely do exclusions. If you choose to exclude, consider installing a bat house. And these are some of the approved bat houses. Uh, at the end of the program, I'll have a slide with this information uh, in case you want to write it down. Uh, if you're shopping around for bat house, you need to be very careful. Many are poorly constructed of cheap material that will deteriorate rapidly, and they may not even meet bat needs, and some are even dangerous. Be sure any house you purchase meets uh, Merlin, bat, Merlin Tuttle's Bat Conservation and Bat Conservation International standards. And these are some of the designs. And this is the first bat house ever built. In 1911, a Texas physician built a bat tower to fight malaria carrying mosquitoes. The onslaught of mosquitoes near Mitchell Lake in San Antonio was so intense that farmers from the surrounding land were forced to flee. In the year Campbell's bat tower was built, most adults and children living around the lake had malaria. Four years after the Mitchell Lake bat tower was built, there was not a single case of malaria among the families living around the lake. The experiment was a huge success. Unfortunately, due to a misguided fear of rabies, the tower was torn down several years later. And bats have, uh, in San Antonio, bats have been living in Bracken Cave for 10,000 years. And in addition to eating mosquitoes, the 15 million Mexican free-tailed bats living in Bracken Cave, San Antonio, consume 140 tons of crop destroying insects per night. 
which saves cotton farmers in South Central Texas about $740,000 a year. So rabies, some facts. The vast majority of bats do not have rabies. Only one half of 1% of bats ever contract the disease. Bats do not carry rabies. In other words, they don't fly around spreading the virus as uh, they don't shed the virus as they're, as they're flying. Uh, the virus is transmitted through a bite, a deep scratch, or rarely through contact with mucous membranes. Furious rabies is characterized by spasm of the muscles of the throat and diaphragm, hyperactivity, excessive salivation, paralysis, coma, and death. Animals with furious rabies become extremely aggressive and prone to snapping and biting indiscriminately. Passive or par paralytic rabies, in which paralysis is the predominant symptom that is characterized by muscle weakness spreading throughout the body, also called dumb rabies. Um, bats rarely, um, it, it, bat, even rabid bats very rarely attack other animals. They tend to just crawl into a corner and die within three to seven days of uh, uh, the, onset of the, uh, the onset of the clinical symptoms. That is a rabid bat. You can see the saliva um, because the bat cannot swallow. It's called, uh, rabies is called hydrophobia, which means fear of water. It's not that the animal is afraid of water. It's because it cannot drink or eat when it's in that stage of rabies. Although rabies may cause an animal to behave erratically, sometimes aggressively, it's rare for bats to bite unless cornered or grabbed. Obviously, no one should handle a bat, try to rescue a bat, pick up a bat with bare hands. Heavy gloves are essential. A bat that can be easily approached by humans is much more likely than other bats to be sick, and it may bite if handled. Do not touch or handle a bat or any other wild animal, and there is little chance of being bitten. Teach children to never handle any wild animal. This is uh, the result of a uh, bite bat, a bat bite, something like that. Approximately one and a half million Mexican free-tailed bats live under the Congress Avenue Bridge in downtown Austin, Texas attracting tens of thousands of people each summer to watch the bats emerge on their nightly insect hunts. No human case of bat transmitted rabies has ever been recorded in Austin or surrounding communities. And the bats have been living under the bridge for uh, almost three decades. Seeing a bat outside in daytime does not necessarily mean it is, ra it is rabid. It might be an orphan in need of help. It might be thirsty, hungry, and tired. It might be hurt and in need of help. However, again, I have to stress that a grounded bat is much more likely to be ill and it's possible that it would be ill with rabies. So you have to keep that in mind and take every precaution. So here are lo our, our local bats and all of them are in trouble. Again, from left to right, the little brown bat, all are on the endangered species list except uh, the uh, uh, big brown bat who also has taken a huge uh, hit in its population due to white nose syndrome, but it's not, it's the only one not listed to one degree or other. So the little brown bat is endangered, big brown, not. Hoary bat, listed as special concern, Silver-haired bat, special concern. Tricolor bat, endangered. These were very plentiful at one time and now they're almost never found. Eastern red bat, special concern. Indiana bat, endangered. Small-footed bat, and actually that is backwards. Uh, that's a small footed bat, that's the Indiana, Indiana, but both are endangered. Northern myotis, federally endangered. Here are the threats to bats. 
snakes, hawks and owls, domestic cats, vandalism, windmill farms, eviction, habitat destruction, white nose syndrome. Domestic cats, like all wildlife, bats have natural enemies. Among them are snakes, owls, and hawks. Natural predators keep nature in balance. Domestic cats are an invasive species and their sheer number has thrown that balance way off. House cats, whether hungry or not, take a huge toll on wildlife, including bats. Feral cats compete with native wildlife for scarce resources. Cats are often fed by well-meaning people, which only increases the population and adds to the problem. A good way to help bats and other wildlife is to keep pet cats indoors and support spay neuter programs for feral cats. Um, and here's just one incident uh, of which there are many. In only eight days, a single cat killed 53 of 70 endangered gray bats known to inhabit Dunbar Cave in Tennessee. And this is a gray bat carrying her pup. So cats are a real problem. Windmills, unfortunately, wind generated electricity is renewable and clean, but wind energy facilities often take an alarming toll on bat and bird populations, giving new urgency to the scientific search for solutions. One solution is to simply slow down the blades when bats and birds are migrating. Companies are working on new windmill designs as well. And uh, folks who uh, uh, can write to power companies, uh, many power companies are, uh, 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 investing in, in wind energy. Uh, and it's good to let them know that you care about the bird and bat strikes that occur. Uh, habitat loss, of course. Bats are losing their natural habitats around the world because of increasing land development, agriculture, and deforestation. They are also routinely losing their homes in attics, barns, and outbuildings due to eviction from roosting sites. And these are horrible, they're glue strips, they should not be allowed, uh, but they are unfortunately sold in many uh, places, uh, uh, large places like Home Depot and even smaller garden supply uh, places. Uh, animals as large as kittens and owls can become victims to these horrible, cruel snares. Once caught, they die very slowly and agonizingly. No matter how you feel about mice, no creature deserves to die this way. Bats zeroing in on flying insects often get caught in fly strips and glue traps. It's heartbreaking. Spread the word to friends and neighbors. Don't buy glue traps, please. And here we have white nose syndrome. White nose syndrome was unknowingly carried to the US by people who explored European caves where the fungus was present. Bats with the fungus on their muzzles date back to the early 1980s, but it was not associated with mass mortality because the bats co-evolved with the fungus and therefore had resistance to its devastating effects. White nose syndrome has caused the steepest decline of North American wildlife in the past century. 100% of bats have died at some sites, including caves in New England and New York. A white fungus grows on the noses and sometimes wings, ears, and tails of most infected bats. The fungus, Geomyces destructans, GD, was discovered in a cave in New York in 2006. In 2013, Pseudogeomino ascus destructans, PD, a mutant form of the disease, was isolated. Five local bat species, including the already endangered Indiana bat, were infected. More than 7 million bats have died from white nose syndrome so far. Humans carry white nose syndrome from infected sites to clean sites. Since February 2006, white nose syndrome has spread rapidly throughout the Eastern United States. It is now documented in 39 US states and seven Canadian provinces. It's still on the move and has been recently found in Texas. The fungus invades deep skin tissue and causes extensive damage. Affected bats arouse more often during hibernation, which causes them to burn the crucial fat reserves. Additional causes include impairment due to wing damage, resulting in 
uh, reduced circulatory and thermoregulatory capabilities. Starvation and dehydration is the ultimate fate of most bats infected with white nose syndrome. This abandoned church at Canoe Creek in central Pennsylvania housed a maternity colony of 20,000 little brown bats uh, before the onset of white nose syndrome. In 2008, white nose syndrome struck the area and in a 2012 survey, only 155 bats were found at the site. And here I am checking up on the once thriving colony in 2004. And there is a little brown bat. These are as well. Some good news. Researchers are working on a solution to treating bat colonies on mass and potentially discovering the right combination of antifungal treatments to prevent death by white nose syndrome entirely. Surveys show that some diminished populations seem to have stabilized. Survivors of the initial infection may continue to survive with the potential to reestablish battered communities. Biologists at Fort Drum in New York have been monitoring a colony of little brown bats for years. When white nose syndrome first struck, the population plummeted. But in recent years, individual bats were healing and were seen again the following spring and summer. And uh, this is one of the biologists um, and uh, a certain site at uh, the army base, uh, the bats have been doing really well, which is uh, providing great information for researchers. A little bat brown bat colony was discovered in Litchfield, Connecticut. Rare Eastern small-footed bats found in Salem, Groton, Madison, and Colchester, Connecticut. Rare Northern long-eared bat found in Westbrook, Connecticut. And here is uh, in an Eastern small-footed bat, uh, which I had the privilege of raising from a tiny pup. Uh, he weighed 1.5 grams when found. Uh, he uh, stayed with me for about a month or a little more than a month. And then uh, Linda Bowen, a very skilled rehabber took over uh, because at the time my uh, flight cage, my renovated flight cage was not built yet. And Linda had a flight cage. Uh, so here is LB, we, we call them that for uh, meaning little bit. And here he is getting used to uh, a larger enclosure before going into the flight cage. And there he is stretching his um, beautiful wing. You can see how delicate, very delicate, but very tough. And now he's gonna hide. And he was successfully released uh, by the DEEP. Uh, I was there and so was Linda. Uh, uh, across the road from where he was found. Oh, we don't need an encore. And since then, amazingly, three more were found. In 2020, an adult was found in Groton and one in Colchester. In 2021, the latest find was in Madison, proof that although rare, there are breeding populations in Connecticut. And these photos are, were for, uh, uh, taken by Sean Stevens, who found um, two of the little bats. And when he found them, um, he's a, a, a nuisance wildlife control officer, but he also has a rehabber's license. And when he found the bats, because someone uh, called and said there were bats in, their, in the house, he realized right away that these bats were not uh, the typical big brown uh, bat. And he called me and, uh, measurements and et cetera were done. And sure enough, they, uh, they were Eastern small footed bats and are, and have been successfully released. And here is one of, oops, one of them. 
being fed a mealworm. Uh, not a very good shot. Yeah. A little bit sloppy. My friend David took the video while I was feeding the little bat. That was a couple of days after uh, he was found by Sean and transferred to me. Covered with oatmeal goo. Oatmeal goo. It looks like that, but it's mealworm goo. And here is an extremely enlarged picture of the uh, northern long-eared bat, uh, which was found in Westbrook, Connecticut, which um, I also uh, raised from a tiny pup. He weighed um, 1.5 grams, I believe, something like that. And he also uh, transferred him to Linda after uh, five or six weeks. Um, and she knew a really great photographer who took these pictures, which were vital because this part of the bat, along with other uh, identifiers for a, a, a northern uh, long-eared bat, the tragus is the uh, the absolutely uh, is the absolute uh, best indication that uh, we have a uh, northern long-eared bat here, and so this picture proved it once and for all, which was really cool. And here he is on the ground when he was found by uh, a uh, uh, one of the staff at uh, West uh, Westbrook um, U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife in Westbrook. At intake, he weighed two grams, less than the weight of a penny. And an artificial bat cave was built in New in New Milford. Uh, ONG Industries constructed a bat hibernaculum at the company's New Milford Quarry. The hibernaculum was constructed in hopes of preserving a population of bats who overwinter there in a natural cave while protecting them from white nose syndrome. According to DEEP who worked with them on the project, the New Milford Quarry is currently one of the few disease-free habitats in the state. ONG completed the project in July of 2016. So far, it appears to be a success. Other artificial caves have been built in Blanco County, Texas and elsewhere, such as the Nature Conservancy's cave on the Tennessee-Kentucky border. So help bats and they'll help you. Build or buy a BCI approved bat house. Go to www.batcon.org or uh, search for uh, Merlin Tuttle's Bat Conservation a website, uh, also full of great information. Create a garden of local species plants to benefit backyard wildlife. Leave dead trees standing. Snags are vital roosting hibernating sites. Don't use pesticides. Educate friends and neighbors about the benefits of bats. Tell legislators to protect what's left of our wild lands and clean waters. Support environmental organizations. Keep pet cats indoors. Visit the website of Bat Conservation International for more info about bats. And I thank you. And here again, uh, here's my contact information. If you have any questions at all uh, after this program is over and something occurs to you, or if you need help with uh, finding or constructing a bat house or just about anything batty, um, please feel free to contact me and uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Great. Uh, Great. Very, uh, very interesting. Um, program um, program am, I echoing? am I echoing? You are echoing a little and breaking up a little. Okay. Let's see how we do. Um, our first question was, what does it take to become a bat rehabilitator? Aha. Well, first you need to get a license, a wildlife rehabilitator's or custodian's license through uh, the uh, DEEP. Um, you then need to take classes and you have to pass a test. Uh, when, when you pass the test, you need to do an apprenticeship with a licensed rehabber. Uh, and there are uh, different categories. You can specialize, you can generalize, some people are uh, listed as just taking small mammals. Uh, some people, migratory birds for which a special license is needed. Um, vector species such as raccoons, uh, a special license is needed. 
but anyway, yeah, you can go to the uh, DEEP website uh, and there's a drop down menu and uh, you'll find the information there that you need to become a rehabber. And gosh, I sure hope more people uh, become interested in uh, rehabbing bats. Uh, they're highly specialized uh, and it, it takes a lot of extra information, uh, but yeah, uh, people are needed. Do you have any bats now? Yes, um, currently I have um, four juvenile bats that I raised from pups. One bat that uh, was given to me that was um, taken from someone else who had it. Uh, and it's, uh, since I have the flight cage, it's better off with me. It's an adult, it's in the flight cage now. Uh, and a couple of days ago, I, uh, someone at a local lumber yard found a, an Eastern red bat that was grounded. Uh, he was kind enough to rescue it, although it's horrible to think about, but uh, his colleagues wanted to squash it with a shovel. Um, I have the bat, it has a broken wing. It's doing fine. Um, it's non-releasable. Uh, it will never fly again due to the injury. Um, but I also have a permit from the USDA to keep non-releasable bats uh, for educational purposes. Um, and so far she's doing fine. Okay, um, Shepard had asked, when you hand raise pups, do they bond with you? Uh, well, yeah, and here's a fine line. They don't imprint like a baby bird will. And, I, and some mammals do as well, some other kinds of mammals do as well, but bats don't imprint. That being said, they know very well who the person is, who the caretaker is, and interact with that person. So the fine line is that they need, in addition to the nourishment, they need to be nurtured, they need to, be, to feel secure uh, and safe. So the rehabber has to provide that at the same time, remembering that this animal, uh, the goal is to release him or her back into the wild. Um, often, well, not often, but sometimes when, uh, after the bats are in the flight cage and they seem to be uh, doing well, flying well, catching insects, and then they're released, if they're not doing well enough in the wild, in the outside world, I have actually had them come back uh, and land on my shoulder or land on the screen outside of my uh, bat facility uh, because they weren't ready to be released, in which case I take them back and either overwinter them uh, and release them the following spring after they've had some more uh, experience in the flight cage uh, but yeah, these are highly intelligent animals. They, they are aware of everything that's going on around them. Okay, so a couple of plant questions. One mm -hmm. is whether or not Connecticut's bats pollinate plants. They do not. All of the bats in Connecticut are uh, eat insects. And um, uh, the, each bat is a specialist. Um, the larger bats, of course, will eat uh, larger insects, uh, but they will take advantage of the smaller ones if, you know, if they're around. Um, little brown bats, which have taken a huge hit um, due to white nose syndrome and, and other problems, um, were and are uh, mosquito experts, uh, as well as eastern pipistrels, um, eastern small-footed bats, the smaller, the smaller bats, of course, eat, uh, tend to eat the smaller insects, although they can consume uh, pretty large insects as well. Um, big brown bats, again, they specialize in moths, beetles, uh, uh, crop pests. Uh, they will eat mosquitoes and smaller insects, but uh, you know, if you're flying around and there's a mosquito on one side of you and a big fat moth on the other side, uh, you know, who are you gonna eat? Uh, I, I would say probably the moth. But every one of these bats that are our backyard buddies are crucial 
to our crops, to the, the, the crops we grow in our gardens, and to uh, uh, farmers that have uh, larger, uh, larger scale uh, 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 facilities, if that's the word I want, well, you know what I mean. Okay, so Rosemary from Harwinton wanted to know if you could suggest three native plants that would be advantageous for backyard bats. And I'm imagining maybe those would be plants that are particularly attractive to insects. Ah, well, yeah, all, all plants, uh, whatever kind they are, are, uh, you know, attract insects of one kind or other. Um, if you have a vegetable garden and you want to keep, um, say, uh, moths from, from eating uh, your squash plants, uh, then bats are out there to help you with that. Um, if you're planting flowers, then, you know, generally there are, there are no specific plants, the flowers that I can think of that would attract certain kinds of, of moths that would eat them uh, or, or uh, beetles. Uh, of course, you know, there's, uh, there are Japanese beetles that attack beans um, bats will eat them. Uh, so yeah, you know, it's, it's crop plants that they're really good at uh, helping folks with, as well as flowers though. But yeah, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't say a specific kind of flower. Okay. Just so native you, flowers, native plants for native sure. Plants, yes. So does white nose syndrome affect all kinds of bats? It affects the crevice bats more than the tree dwelling bats. Um, it, it is uh, not unheard of with the tree dwelling bats because sometimes they do go into caves to hibernate. Uh, and what happens is the fungus is it's a, a cold loving fungus and it lives in the walls of the cave or mine. And when the bat hibernates, the body temperature of the bat is exactly the same as the uh, temperature of the uh, uh, the uh, cave wall. And so the fungus does not differentiate between the cave wall and the bat and the fungus crawls onto the bat. Um, so um, usually uh, tree dwelling bats don't hibernate in mines. Uh, they hibernate under uh, leaf mulch, tree bark, tree hollows. Uh, and again, uh, often they migrate to warmer climates uh, but not always, some of them don't. So none of this is set in stone. Um, but uh, the crevice bats are those that are, are much more prone to uh, white nose syndrome. The um, big brown bats are a little bit more resistant and that's why they haven't taken such a huge uh, crash in the population. Although 40% is, is pretty bad. Okay, there's a couple of questions regarding bat houses, uh, whether some do's and don'ts, how high to put the bat house, um, where to put a bat house, that sort of thing. Crucial. And again, the bat house you buy or build is very important. Um, all kinds of people sell them. Uh, you know, you can buy them on Amazon or uh, at local farm shops or whatever. Um, and um, it's best to research. Again, your best bet is Merlin Tuttle's Bat Conservation or Bat Conservation International. Uh, as far as placement, many people um, make the mistake of putting a bat house in a tree. Um, female bats are those that occupy bat houses usually. Females are looking for a warm place to raise their pups. Uh, the pups are born uh, hairless um, for many crevice bats, um, including big brown bats. And so the females are looking for, believe it or not, uh, a bat house that will, can maintain, can be, can get as warm as a hundred degrees. Um, and so placing the bat house on a pole or the side of a building that has southeastern exposure uh, is best for the bats. An ideal thing is to have one house facing southeast and the other northwest 
so that if the warm house gets too warm, mom will take the baby and move, uh, move, the, move the baby to the cooler house. When bats occupy attics or barns, what they do is when they want the heat, they're in the peak of the attic or barn. And when it gets too hot, they move down to the eaves. If it's still too hot, they actually will take the pups and move out from the barn or attic for a while and think, until things cool down. They'll go into surrounding trees or forests or, or wherever they can find a cooler place. Okay. Maureen, you're such a wealth of information. I was wondering if you could recommend any good books about bats for people to learn oh, a little oh. bit more. Well, uh, Merlin Tuttle, the founder of Bat Conservation International, has several great books. Uh, I own all of them. Uh, and here, you know, Amazon will uh, actually, if you go to um, Bat Conservation International uh, and purchase through that site, then uh, the proceeds will go to, to them. Um, whereas if you purchase through Amazon, um, I don't know where the proceeds go to except for the billionaire who owns the, uh, who owns the company. But there are, oh, there are wonderful, uh, right now, of course, off the top of my head, although there are a bunch of them right behind me in my bookshelf. Um, is there one, Again. My Neighborhood Bats or something like that? Yes. My Neighborhood Bats is one of the first um, and uh, chock full of information. But yeah, he's had several out since then, including one with, uh, it's called Bats of the World, I believe. Uh, and it's illustrated. He's a, a renowned photographer uh, in, in addition to being uh, a, an expert on bats and he has been for 60 years. Um, so all of his beautiful photography is in uh, a couple of those books. And gosh, I wish I could think of the title off the top of my head. But again, uh, they're, they're, e they're uh, easy enough to find or uh, after the program, if you wanna contact me, I will have the list of books to share. I was also going to suggest if folks wanted to meet you and or a bat, you will be at the Bat Appreciation Day on September 12th at Old Newgate Prison in Coppermine. Uh, the time is from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. And I we're just about, uh-huh. I plan, I, I will be there, um, probably along with uh, Baticus B. Brown, who is a, um, juvenile big brown bat who is not releasable because he is a little bit slow uh, developing. He's not as advanced as the other uh, juveniles at this age. Uh, so he probably will be released next spring, um, but I will probably have him with me. That's wonderful. I hate to ask, but do you have a favorite bat? Oh gosh. You mean a favorite kind, the species, yes. Yes. or one that's in my? <laughs> oh a wow! Favorite kind. I guess because they're so darn beautiful and striking, uh, the hoary bats. Um, again, a sixteen-inch wingspan. The fur is um, multicolored. Uh, if anyone is familiar with. Uh, what a blue merle border collie <laughs> looks like. Uh, that's what the uh, fur of a, 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 a hoary bat is. And they're called hoary bats because the tip of the fur uh, is silver and it looks like hoar frost. And uh, many times um, you can be walking in the backyard and these bats are flying all around. Uh, they tend to fl fly lower than a big brown bat or a little brown bat, which if you're lucky enough uh, and it's still light enough, and if you look up in the sky, you'll see though them flitting around in the sky. Um, hoary bats tend to fly a bit lower. And in fact, they are called, they are gleaners as well as catching insects in uh, uh, flight. They glean insects from the top of plants. And as they're going along, they are using social calls to, con to be, uh, stay in contact with others 
of their species. And the social calls are audible to human uh, uh, ears, uh, whereas the echolocation in most cases is not. So the social calls might sound like clicking, like um, and uh, you might not realize that what you're hearing is a bat. Very cool. Well, I hope you have a chance to look in the chat, Maureen, because people are really appreciating your presentation and you've helped some reconsider their fear of bats, um, some that wanna help, help bats now. So I wanna thank you very much for this presentation and you have your contact information up there. Um, and at this time, let me go ahead and send it right over to Sue. Well, okay, thank you, thank you so much. Yep. And thank you, Maureen, for taking your time and, and sharing your evening with us. Just to remind everybody that you are in time, if you'd like to spend a little time out in this very hot and humid day, uh, for some bat watching in your backyard. See if you have any bats in your area and appreciate for all the work that they're doing to eat mosquitoes and other bugs that could become problems for us. Uh, September has International Bat Week. So that is when you can go out and visit the Old Newgate pr uh, Prison and see also uh, some bats and meet Maureen herself. In September also, you can enjoy a storybook walk at the Kellogg Environmental Center located on Hawthorne Avenue in Derby, where we'll feature the children's book Bats at the Beach, which is a series of children's stories by Brian Lies, showing bats in fantastical life after dark. So by all means, enjoy bats as you can and way before winter comes. Thank you again, and we hope to see you in future webinars. Thank you, Sue, and thank you, Laura. Thanks, Maureen.